what if one of the creators of one of the most successful fitness programs in history would say that he thinks fitness is horrible? He hates fitness, has nothing to do with it, really. Well, we're going to talk to that guy on today's episode of The Movement Movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body, starting feet first, because, you know, those things are your foundation, although he might take it in a whole different direction. What do I know? And he's got a cat on his lap, which we can talk about, too. (laughs) Um, We're now dog people in our house instead of cat people, but that's a whole other conversation. Anyway, this podcast for people who want to know what it takes to be able to run or walk or hike or play or do yoga or CrossFit, whatever you like to do, and to do it enjoyably, efficiently, effectively. And wait, did I say enjoyably? Trick question. I know I did. Because look, if you're not having fun, you're not going to keep doing it. So find something that you want to do that's fun. And I am Stephen Sashin from ZeroShoes.com, your host of the podcast. And we call it the movement movement because we're creating a movement. You know, that involves people. You are one of those people. I'll tell you about that. It's really easy. About natural movement, letting your body do what bodies are are supposed to do. And what else can I say about that? The movement part is really simple. Um, We're just trying to spread the word. So go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com. You'll find previous episodes, all the ways you can interact with the podcast, which means like and share and give us a thumbs up, hit the bell icon on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. You know how that works. And in short, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. And so um, let us jump in. Mason, tell people who you are and why you're here and I don't know if we want to start on what I teased in the intro. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. So who are you? What are you doing here? And why did I say what I said? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, Stephen. I'm uh, like most people. I'm a lifelong fitness enthusiast, but I don't like fitness. And when I got into, when I directed P90X, it was like, it was like the last thing on my list. If you were like, do you want to do car commercials? Do you want to do this? But I was very lucky. And what I did was just really flip it around because prior to that, it was like Jane Fonda and everything was pastel and perfect. And I really wanted to have fun. I wanted to make uh, fitness enjoyable. If you were going to spend an hour working out, I wanted it to be something that was an experience and fun, not just counting reps or talking about weights and posture. So I joke and say, I don't care about fitness. I care about entertainment because Mm. in front of the camera, and you can entertain people, well, then they keep coming back and they don't think about it as fitness. And then, you know, lo and behold, if uh, you show up on a regular basis, you're going to get some results. I always find the phrase working out very funny because who wants to work and why are you doing this, something called working out indoors? It seems a little now odd to me, but, you know, you and I have a P90X connection. Do you know about this? What? No, I do not. What is it? All right. One evening, Sunday evening, my wife and I are on the couch watching TV as we do, because as an entrepreneur, I think the most important skill you can have is knowing how to turn on a television and turn your brain off (laughs) because holy crap. Anyway, phone rings. I look at it and the caller ID says Tony Horton. You know, Tony Horton. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Tony was for people who don't know or remember, he was the guy in P90X. Tony is Tony is Mr. P90X. Yes. So I say, hey, look at this. And my wife says, well, if he's, you know, the famous guy you think he is, then why is he calling your cell phone <laughs> right. on a Sunday night at eight o'clock? And so I went, yeah, all right, I'll let it go to voicemail. And then a couple hours later, I checked the messages and it was in fact Tony. And I oh. call him back and um, we hit it off like way too crazily. I mean, we're in many ways brothers from another mother and just had so much fun and happily. And you don't know this apparently. Tony's been like, you know, wearing zero shoes for a couple of years now. And, um, um, has turned almost everybody into uh, turned almost everybody he bumps into into zero shoes fans because they put them on and like them. So that's awesome. That's my wacky connection to P90X. But so how did you become a P90X director? And people might find this interesting. What does it mean to direct? Well, I don't know if you did the infomercials as well as the workouts themselves, but what does that mean? And how does one get that kind of a weird gig that no one ever even thinks about? They don't exactly. even realize you know, what you do to do that. Well, back when I directed it, the end of 2003, believe it or not, like we're close to 20, the 20 year mark. Holy moly. Um, it was just by luck. So my, one of my sister's roommates had married the CEO and Beachbody was a very Beachbody. small startup. And Carl and I became friends. He said, I'm looking for somebody to do, you know, young directors. And I became part of the original P90S test group, P90X test group. And Uh, One thing led to another, and I ended up being the one who directed it. But I kid and say, or not really, but back then doing a 
a fitness video to me was akin to doing a wedding video or porn. It was like the same, like nobody cares. Uh, you're you're going to get some money and it's just, but it, it's not a career. Well, just builder. slightly sweatier than the latter and slightly, yeah, okay. more, slightly more interesting than the former. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and there's a lot of those jobs that I had turned down along the way, but this one felt like there was some opportunity there. And one of the big opportunities that I latched onto was Carl, the CEO had said, this is going to be completely different. It's extreme. And just the completely different part, I was like, great. So there's there's room for me to bring in some other ideas. And he, he had a crew of producers and everything that I was wanting to change, they all kept on like going, you can't do that. That's not, that's not how it's done. And I said, yeah, that's how we're going to do it. And Carl kept on saying, yeah, I trust this guy. So well, let's, well, well, let's back up around that era. What did the fitness, I mean, hold on, 20, 23. So I was long out of coaching and teaching by then. I was working at a gym in New York in 19, when did I graduate high school? 1980, so 1980, 81, when aerobics was the thing. Uh, yeah. And so leg warmers were everywhere. Yeah, uh, but so now we're talking 20 years after that, even what was the universe looking like? And what were you then looking to do to shake that up? Jane Fonda was still on the scene, Richard Simmons, Tybo, like these were the leading brands and they all had some. Sorry, wait, and sorry, Billy yeah. Blanks, where's your Billy issues? Blanks. Yeah. Hey, you're nice. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've got some good endorsers there. Well, you know, Billy, um, the problem get, with Billy. got to get Jane. You got to get Jane I in. got to get, oh man, that'd be great. Uh, the problem with Billy is that um, I probably shouldn't have even said that because while he's been wearing our shoes, he won't publicly say that like a number of other people, unless I gave him an insanely large amount of money, oh. um, which, you know, we just, we're not that kind of company. Well, you can uh, say it. I can, uh, that's, I guess um, we've seen, well, yeah, to that's, uh, you know, there's things we're not allowed to do. Like there is, there is a photo circulating around the internet of Billie Eilish wearing our shoes, speaking oh, of cool. Billie's, but we can't like, you know, promote yeah, that yeah, right. per se. Yeah. So it's, Anyway. All right. So, yeah. So it was Jane Fonda, Richard Simmons, Ty, although Tybo was kind of breaking out of the mold because that was trying to, you know, well, it, it was, was and it wasn't. I mean, the big difference in the production and I would say in the approach that I took is that, right, there wasn't really directors of fitness. Like right. they just set up cameras and people did their thing. I approach it very much as theater. I looked at it as I've got all these talented people I get to work with, not just in front, but behind the camera. I'm a very creative person. I'm a, a an artist at heart. I grew up as a, an actor at the High School of Performing Arts and studied dance outside of it. And I just love musical theater. And so eventually I got into film and video and directing and producing. And so when I did P90X, I just brought all of that to the table. I was like, how do I make this without overthinking it? I really didn't yeah. like, I didn't say, I want to make this entertaining. I was doing it because it was fun for me, but I, I didn't like the repetition and just the music that most other brands relied on. You know, you think of, you think of Billy Blanks at the time and I love, I loved aerobics, but it was a repetition that was mm. uh, the driving beat to it. Uh, Jane Fonda was music and all of these, including everything that was done at Beachbody at the time, they were shot in blocks. People took breaks. They toweled down. They <laughs> reshot things. And I said, I said, we're doing it one take. And everybody thought I was nuts. And they were like, I, why, are you, why do you want to do that? And I said, well, this is supposed to be extreme. Well, so and that's that, what you're asking the people, the people who bought it to do is do it in one. And, and it, it seems so obvious. Brilliant. But yet it was still not how things were done. And I was very much looking for the saga of it, the breakdown. I wanted Tony to push as much as he did with me in the uh, test group. I wanted to see people fail. I wanted to see the drama of how incredibly challenging this was. And I broke the third wall. We brought cameras into the set and had Tony talking to them. And I hired real people. We we cast people that had been through test groups. We cast people from real life. It was only and and prior to that, it was all fitness models. So we had a couple of them, but and that really made it fun. And but the biggest compliment I ever got was hearing people as 
I, I directed every P90X there was except for the very last one, which was P90X3, but there was P90X Plus and P90X one-on-one that went on for years and P90X2. And I would get this note every once in a while from a fan, somebody who was part of the Beachbody community. They'd say, man, your stuff is so good. I will sit down and watch it and have some popcorn the first time before I even work out. Like that's how, and I, at first I thought it was a joke. And then I realized it's like, no, I'm dead serious. Like that's how entertained I am. I just like enjoy watch. Well, you know what's, but you know, what's funny. There's the flip side of that too. Cause I remember seeing some of the original infomercials and they were so engaging that you, I mean, I literally remember getting off the couch to follow along with the infomercial. Yeah. Which, which was not something you could do with any of the other ones. I mean, yeah, it was it like a great storytelling. That was, that was done by somebody else. But mm. of course, all, you know, the, the videos, the cutaways of the videos and the before you. and afters were because of the product. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. So then how are you to say more about then your thoughts about fitness from what you did as again, being a pivotal component, that's a horrible term. I couldn't think of a better one. Uh, critical component. That's what I was looking for. Um, of one of the most influential, if not the most influential uh, um, fitness products to now. The question is, where are we at now or where? No, well, you know, I, it's more like where, how has your thinking evolved or how has even what you do evolved as, oh, you know, yeah. now that you and I have, and other people I hear rumors have gotten older, um, that changes things as well. Sure. So, and just, you know, and as things have evolved in the fitness world, I mean, of course, the joke is the biggest change in fitness in the last 20 years is testosterone, um, but that's a whole other story. So, I mean, it's just unbelievable the number of people who are suddenly diagnosed with low testosterone, which is a statistically meaningless uh, phrase. So, but, but since you were kind of behind the scenes there and really seeing what was what for for quite a while was a a real trend and things have evolved. I mean, now CrossFit is a thing, quote, functional fitness. I'm putting air quotes around that is a thing, you know, Zumba is a thing, which is some, what does someone call that? Oh, they call it white person jazzercise, which I thought was a pretty funny phrase. Um, I'm not trying to diss Zumba. I just thought it was kind of entertaining, but it's an interesting thing. Zumba is, you know, much more low impact and dancey rather than Mm -hmm. sort of, you know, high intensity, whatever CrossFit is trying to take high intensity to a, an extreme The first time I, someone put me through a CrossFit workout, they're trying to like yell at me to motivate me. I went, right. It's not an actual competition. So you're yelling at me is doing nothing. If there's a guy next to me that I want to beat, that'll work. Otherwise I'm just doing this for me, but you know, but, but that's just because of the way my brain works. Um, But anyway, I mean, the way fitness has evolved in the last 20 years is tremendous. Oh yeah. It's uh, I I think the good news about where we're at in fitness today is so many more people are aware uh, that they need fitness in their lives and older people. You know, I consider myself in the older category in my mid fifties. Like there wasn't a lot of people exercising in their fifties when I was a kid, you know, God no. maybe walking, but like um, playing casual tennis. There you go. Yeah. You know, it was, a, and today people take it really seriously. I know I take it very seriously and it doesn't mean that you have to be extreme. So yeah. where have we gone? P90X certainly had its moment. I will say the lessons that I personally learned from it were it's too extreme. Like you really, it's easy to get injured if you weren't really listening to your body, which Tony always preached, but it's a lot harder to do when you're also being told, you know, go for it. Well, there's also, there's also a line that I say, which is you don't know you did too much too soon until you've done too much too soon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I still like right now I've had like a, a week and a half hiatus where I just didn't have my normal routine down and getting back into it. I know that, you know, if I turn on the music and I get it in my head, I'll do too much. And then I have another, then I have a couple days where like, I can't really work out because there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. But if I, if I really just go, okay, 20 minutes of like moderate working out and then the next day, maybe move on to some cardio and then maybe come back to strength. But that takes time to understand that. It's hard. 
it's, it's hard because you want to push. Yeah. Cause going, push. yeah, going hard is, you know, going all out is more fun than knowing that you're pulling back in order to build back up. I mean, I've been off the track for a couple of months cause I have a messed up spine and I did something um, yeah. where my sciatic flipped out and I haven't been able to run for a couple of months and I'm going to be on the track this weekend. And it's the same conversation. It's like, That's how it. do I do these high intensity drills at 50%? How do I do right. my all out sprint at 60% and just, you know, do that. Frankly, this is, we're taping this in the beginning of November. How do I do that for the next month? Yeah. So I'm ready for the next indoor meet, which is six weeks from now. Yeah. It's hard. It is. But again, back to where we're at in fitness today yeah. is more people are aware and it's more accessible than ever. The thing that I preach and talk about, which goes back to P90X, which I still use as kind of my anchor because it was such a, a change is that, Somebody like yourself, who's self-motivated, who's in the industry, who's creating products and stuff, it's a different story. But the average person has access to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of videos and experts, experts claiming <laughs> they can get you in shape. Right. And so the good and the bad there is it's a, it's more accessible. People are more aware of the opportunities to be in shape. The bad part is it's a glut of kind of... I don't know, mush. There's yeah. not to find somebody you connect with who not only understands it, but then can motivate and entertain you. So my, my big thing is take an expert and teach them how to be a performer. And then you really have a magic recipe. Because otherwise the entire training you need to be a fitness professional is to be able to count to 12. Exactly. Like and that's, I, I get one of the and, first and sorry, things I wait, do. When for, I'm, sorry, for people who don't get the reference, that's just, you know, the, the maximum number of reps you're going to count to. Yeah. I, I tell trainers, I go, if you're counting while I'm paying you, you are the most expensive counter on the planet. I'm like, stop. <laughs> stop. Oh, shit. Madness. That's and you're not going to teach me how to do a push up. Like, stop, <laughs> stop explaining how to do a push up. It's ridiculous. Like, um, I can't. Okay. Uh, sorry, you're not allowed to say stop the madness. I can't. Why not? Let's Susan start. Powder. Okay. All right. Stop the insanity. Oh, insanity. That's what it was. Yeah. There we go. So it just it's it's as simple as going. We know that we need to get out off our asses, out yeah. from behind the computers, and move our bodies. It's there's no one there's no one magic bullet or secret. You've got to do the moves, and if you're entertained, you find somebody you connect with, then you can keep doing it. It's, and that, that's when success comes. It's really interesting you say that. Um, one of the things that was so fun for me when I got back into track and field now 15 years ago is that it's all the track and field events. So everything from the short sprints, which indoors is 50 or 60 meters, outdoors 100 meters, the shortest that they care about, um, yeah. all the way up to marathons and ultra marathons and beyond. And I say, you know, the thing about, and then of course the field events, I go, the whole advantage of track and field is you can find the thing that works for you, uh -huh. that you enjoy doing. And then you said about the entertaining part, I have two training partners and any, on any given day, at least one of us will say to at least one of the others, I'm so glad you made me come out here because I wouldn't have done it on my own, but we just love hanging out. And, you know, that social component, even if it's not from a coach, from a peer is so critically important. And I think that's often overlooked. Totally. It's uh, and a lot of people don't have that. If you don't have a peer, if you don't have a group, you are looking for something online. You are looking for your own community. And often that comes in this kind of form, which is yeah. you're on camera with somebody or you're working out at home alone. And so it really then falls to the trainer to excel in in reaching through the camera and being able to connect with somebody at home that that's the part that i like working on the most my cat is making so much noise oh it's oh, not coming God. it's not coming through the mic that's cool okay, good i mean no I, and, and fyi so i reluctantly got a cat 30 something years ago and it was my favorite thing ever i mean i i love this cat and everyone who knew her said this is not a normal cat which she was not and then she died and we had two more cats and then they died and we we're thinking oh we're not gonna you know maybe not get any pets and to make a long story short we both got our first dog uh, or more accurately we both got a dog together it's our first dog either um and um my line is i i can't say that i love my dog more than my wife she tells uh, me you better not um, well that's what she's being she, recorded. She, yeah she says i'm not allowed to say that but um but that's okay she thinks the same thing it's 
crazy. Uh, so for both you and we still love cats, but holy smokes, man. I yeah, am, dogs are, I got, I've got my big guy laying here and I, yeah, there you, go. you know, the old adage is like, I don't know what I did to deserve him. You know, it's like, I hadn't heard much that, but be- that much better person than I am. Oh, there's no question about that. Um, it's um, all, all pets. I mean, at some point we were thinking about getting a parrot, actually a kai. <laughs> For people who are into parrots, we were looking at a caique, which is a small Brazilian parrot. But then we realized that we weren't planning on having children and getting a parrot is like having a 33-year-old for 30 years. So <laughs> That's funny. So we decided not to do that. But anyway, so look, backing up to fitness things, if somebody were to approach you at a random social event and uh, and and said they were you know looking to do something, getting into the fitness, not even the fitness business, but they're just looking to find a program, find something to do. They're looking to get in shape. They're trying to lose some weight. They're whatever it is. How do you, given your experience, what do you say to them? How do you respond? Well, I think I'd reframe it and say, if you want to make it, if you're a trainer and you want to make it in the industry today, the only way to do it, besides, of course, just the part that I don't care about is the fitness part. So right. get your fitness credentials, be great at it. That is like square one. The bigger part is most people, if you want to have a, a longevity in the industry today, you really have to have a presence on camera, even if it's even if it's only for marketing. But if the idea is you want to make more money than just the hours you're trading in a gym. You have, you have programs, you can do Zoom, you can do group sessions. And it is, then you can really have a career. But to do that, you have to have a personality. And to have a personality, how, how I coach and explain. So wait, hold on. Where, hold on. Where do you, can you find those on Amazon? Is that? Uh... You can buy your personality in a combo platter. If you, no, <laughs> your, your personality is who you are. And it's, it's one of the most frightening and hardest things to tap into. But like we're sharing stories here in a conversation. The thing that I, teach and preach is that you have to learn how to tell stories about your life through in your fitness workouts, because Mm. I I use the example of the food network or any cooking show. We don't tune in because we're like, Oh, I need to figure out how to make flapjacks. You're tuning in for the story and the emotional value. And yeah, you'll pick up some stuff, but there's not much food network and the channels are running 24 hours a day. There is tons of it. And it's not, recipes right it's storytelling the majority of it that's right. why we watch it and so trainers are just now learning how to tell stories while they're taking you through a hit workout it takes some it takes some work but that's where the, those are the trainers i see excelling and doing really really well is they've that's how they bridge that gap build the community build the trust and really then uh, get fans that follow them forever well that's great uh, from that perspective. And by, uh, before I ask the next question, I do have to back up and say that um, I don't think anyone has ever tried to uh, look for or even tried to make a flapjack in the last 50 years. So um, the fact you like, that you like my old school flapjack yeah, sounds better than a pancake. Yeah, that's I think you're I think you're channeling. I think you're channeling. You're channeling one of the things that makes it different. Yeah, what, absolutely. What it, like you and I even talked about where we were from and how it feels. You were talking about New York and Colorado. And we know you made a joke. You said, I moved on Halloween because the culture shock was going to be less. And for right. those people who don't get that joke, people in New York are so different and strange that only at Halloween in a place in the middle of the country could you even come close to finding absolutely. those kind of people, right? So well, you and I know that in shorthand, but right. what makes... But if you had that conversation with an, a virtual audience and I wasn't here talking to you, explaining that frame in it. such a way yeah. would be, is entertainment. It is interesting to hear where people are from. It is interesting to hear our differences. And by talking about our differences, there's often these deep connections, which is the best part. And um, for any listeners who happen to be trainers or thinking about this and scratching their heads, My favorite moments with trainers is when we get to the heart of who they are, which is usually through our greatest struggles and figuring out how to tell a bit of that story and bring it to the lens. There's something interesting about First of all, um, I'm still stuck on flapjacks and I'm trying to think of what else I can channel from the little rascals to to beat that reference. 
Mm. But, um, but uh, um, yeah, that's a tricky one. I'll think about something Darla said. You know, what, I was at an event for people who wanted to start podcasts. Oh. And after hearing like 50 people pitch what made their podcast so special, I noticed something that was kind of funny and interesting. And it was that everybody was pitching what you just said. It was their story of some struggle and how they overcame that struggle. And there was two things that were interesting to me about that. One is after you hear the 50th person tell their story of struggle and redemption, it's like, yeah, yeah, I've heard it before. So on the one hand, it is what we as humans relate to. On the other hand, everyone was pitching it as if their story was special. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting was it's so universal and not special at all. And that, that sort of weird uh, not conflict, that sort of weird count, contra. Duality. Yeah. It's like, that's just such an odd thing to hold that on the one hand, we relate to these as being very unique, special stories. And yet we all have the exact same thing, which creates a different kind of bonding. Um, and I, I find that fascinating. And of course, I have to throw in the, the flip side is, I mean, my quote, struggle redemption story, just about being a injured runner, taking off my shoes and finding out that that cured me could not be frankly less interesting compared to, you know, or less dramatic than what everyone else was pitching. You know, I've been very fortunate that for whatever reason, mostly because I'm oblivious to many things on the planet, you know, I never had like big struggly things that I had to deal with. I bet you have, I bet you have, and you just don't think they are because of how you look at it in life. That's the other thing is if people don't understand that that could be, I guarantee it's even if we had the time, I would, I would ask you questions and I'd be like, you know, that's, well, let's just say, let me say it this way. I never, I don't have any memory of ever having an experience that seemed like, you know, hitting bottom or like having to ask for help or, I mean, I've just been, and, but literally I don't think I I didn't grow up in some sort of, you know, rarefied privileged air. It was Mm -hmm. really that, um, like I remember, I remember my parents used to take vacations without my sister and I, and it was like, all right, whatever. But I just didn't care. In fact, it was like, oh God, I don't have to think about them for a few weeks. That's awesome. <laughs> so they'd go away for a couple of weeks. They'd go away for two weeks. Yeah. And uh, how old were you? Oh, from the time I was seven or eight, maybe. And who did they leave you with? Well, some human. Um, <laughs> I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, listen, so <laughs> you and I are similar in that respect. I don't look at, um, I don't look at my, the other way of saying it is it doesn't have to be a struggle. It can just be a big shift. It can be a time where things, everything changed. That's, that's oh. it. So, okay. Well, I got one of those. So I, I was embezzled and it was a horrible experience, but I don't spend a whole bunch of time dwelling on yeah. it. I learned from it. I move on. It was a horrible experience, well, but I like in the right time, in the right moment, I share that story. In the right time, uh, in the right moment, I share the story about spending time on a ranch in Montana, even though I'm from New York City, and being being like called out as the city kid and crying. Like, I mean, there. Oh, look, no, no. Those are hard stories to. to no, it, it was worse. You were a city kid who liked musical theater. How did you not get the shit beaten out of you every minute? I, yes, very true. Very, <laughs> see, so exactly. But even though, even though I look back on all these experiences as good ones, yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, what you just said is is funny and very true. Is that there were some some very hard moments growing up, and right? A, like my parents got divorced. I still don't look at you know some people. It's like. It but, 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 you know, this is going to come back to our whole thing about fun. And I still have a question yes. that, that I've had locked and loaded for about five minutes, which is that, and this is me personally, I'm not suggesting other people should be like this, but because yeah. these stories are so universal, uh-huh. I fundamentally don't care about them. Like I've gotten kind of bored with them in a way. So if you're going to interact with me, I'm most likely to not give a lot of weight to your story of woe and misery. And I'm, and by just saying that as being horribly rude, but what I'm more interested in is very rude. Steve. It is. Um, but what I'm more interested in is what you're doing. I mean, when I meet someone um, I'll often say, so what do you do that you find fun and keeps you happy? I don't care what you do for a living. Although if that's what it is, I'm happy to hear it. I want to know what's the, you know, I'm just curious about the cool part, the afterwards part. I don't need the because part before. Well, you know what? Maybe I didn't finish this. It, ultimately, ultimately, a great story is one of redemption and it explains what you've learned and how you have blossomed because of it. So it's not like, 
I get oh, it. woe is me. I'm no, 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 I get it. Yeah. Well, my th- but my thing is, I'm, I, is, for whatever reason, and this is my whacked out psychology, I will confess, uh-huh. I don't even like telling my own stories of anything that may have been unpleasant in the past. And, and there's a weird, uh, again, I'm just revealing a bunch of, you know, my, my bizarro psychology. Lena, my wife, refers to um, uh, something that I do as my most endearing and confusing trait. And that is, there are people who have done things that have cost me in actual dollars, like tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars uh-huh. or more now that I think of it. Um, and in a few cases, literally millions of dollars. And, and when I see those people, I'm still happy to see them and curious to know what they're up to, because I know that what they did, even if it was personal, which it never was, but even if they were trying to deliberately screw me, that's just some messed up thing in their brain. It's not personal. So yeah. why, you know, I don't take it personally. And so I am curious about that. But now I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. How did you arrive? You didn't, you weren't born doing that. I was. Well, that's unusual. I, I agreed. This is my point. No, that's no, this, no. I've been like this for as long as I can remember. Yeah. And, you know, look, you could argue that it's a, it, it's sort of spectrum ish, if you will, but it's really that I just like when someone is, I had a situation like this the, the other day, somebody called me, they were potential investors in our company and they were going to pass on investing in us. And I could tell from the opening line that it was going to be a, it's not you, it's me call. And uh-huh. as soon as they said, look, we're going to, ah, you can stop right there. Um, I know what you're going to say, and I don't care about what you're going to say after the word because. So I will tell you that in six to 12 months, I'll be sending you an email with the subject line. Is it too rude to say I told you so? Um, Because we're going to prove that you're wrong. But that's okay. If you don't believe me now, I don't care. I'm moving on. Or here's a weird version that's relevant for, you know, pulled out of today's headlines. I remember when my when I was going away to a summer camp um, for a couple of weeks when I was, I don't know, uh, 10, actually, I know exactly how old I was. And my dad, who grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania, as a Jewish kid in a predominantly um, Pennsylvania Dutchy neighborhood, um, he got hassled a lot. And so he was sitting me down talking to me about anti-Semitism. And yeah. all I could think when he said, you know, there's these people who might try to get in your way and prevent you from doing things because you're Jewish. All I could think was, well, then I'm just not going to deal with them. I mean, mm. why would I try yeah, and dude. it just didn't occur to me that any, I mean, that just seems silly. It's like, why beat my head against a wall if someone has some crazy thought? And then in, in college, I was dating a woman. Uh, we were having a great time. Then we had like, I don't know, some vacation something that we separated. And when we came back, she totally ghosted me. And this was before that was a verb. Uh-huh. When I finally tracked her down and said, you know, what happened? We were having a great time. She goes, yeah. I found out you were Jewish. And I went, <laughs> wait, are you serious? She goes, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. And I just walked away. <laughs> I had the exact opposite experience of that. I had a really close girlfriend and <laughs> she broke up with me because I wasn't Jewish. <laughs> We're still friends. But I remember I remember going, wait, what? Yeah. Like, yeah, it would never work out. I, I remember saying to my parents when, you know, they did have the marry a nice Jewish girl thing. And I said, look, if I can find anyone who can deal with me, putting an extra barrier in the way of that is yeah. just really a problem. It's not going to be worth it. I get and, your point. I mean, I, yeah. people do it on with religions all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. They do, they, they, they do whatever. Christian, it doesn't matter. But, but suffice it to say, again, you know, what's interesting to me is always the what are we going to do moving forward yes. like i don't care you know this is something that happens even with the, the business someone does something and they made a mistake whatever it was and i say i only care about the because to the extent that you've built in a system for not doing it in the past but i really don't care why you did it i just want to know what you're doing to make sure it doesn't happen again mm-hmm. because talking for me to talk about unless you need me to help you hack out a system i just don't care because it's not going to so help here's us something the interesting faster. that you're doing Uh-oh. pardon me for interrupting is so you're doing a, another version of of entertainment or we are having this conversation where you're talking about your philosophy in life and so that's mm. another way of going that's a little bolder because it can come across as preachy like here's how i believe you should live your oh life. no it's just narcissistic <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot. Listen, to be in front of the camera, you've got to be confident and a little bit of that, too. So. No, but it can come in all sorts of forms of entertainment is my point. I just want to get back yeah. to the idea. Entertainment. OK, you've got to be able to do more than fitness. So if you can do what yes. you're doing, which is here's my philosophy in life. I usually 
like the idea that it stems from something you learn so you can explain the learning process. But you could also do what you're doing right now, which is, hey, this is how I've lived my life and I believe it's a good way and always looking forward. Never. Oh, back. yeah. Well, of course, I would never say that um, because because uh, <laughs> this is going to be a weird one. A friend of mine, another entrepreneur, uh, calls me one day and says, hey, we're getting some people to get together to go to Richard Branson's island to hang out with Richard Branson. Do you want to go? And nice. I, said, I said, why would I do that? I'll, I'll take your place. Well, it, this happened in the past. I said, but why would I have any interest in doing that? They said, well, imagine what you could learn from Richard Branson. I said, I'll tell you what I could learn from Richard Branson. I'm not Richard Branson. Right, yeah. <laughs> no one else is Richard Branson. You know how we know? There's only one Richard Branson. There you go. So, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to spend 20 grand to sit on an island and figure that one out. Oh, with you had to spend guys. 20 grand. Oh, it's going to be stupidly yeah. expensive. Yeah, it was not going to happen. So, so here's the question that I've had locked and loaded for, you know, now about an hour and a half. I'm ready. You got um, me warmed up. So. <laughs> <laughs> now let's start. So uh, we talked about, you know, what you need to do in the fitness world about being a fitness professional. But let's say we're at the same dinner party and someone comes that up to you and be says, a fun one. that would be a fun one. We'll have to do that. We'll get Tony involved, too. That'll be a hoot. Oh, boy. Um, it would be ridiculous. Anyway, ridiculous. Some, so we're at this, we think you and I talk a lot. You can get a word in edgewise with this guy. Well, no, this is why he and I got along so well is that it was just like verbal tennis for an hour and a half. And it was silly. And we said things that are just not fit for human consumption. So we're at said party and someone who comes up to us is not looking to be a fitness professional, but is just looking to get in shape. And without just saying, hey, get some form of P90X, um, given the plethora of options and given your experience and given this whole idea that we want this to be fun and we're talking about the professionals making it entertaining and fun, what do you recommend to someone who's looking for something to do to get in shape or whatever that means? Yeah. I mean, there's so many questions to ask of somebody, but, you know, if right I here, here. I'm that, I'm that guy, hit me. You're, you're that guy. So what do you like to do? First of all, you know, like, I know you, I know you. Well, you're, other, other than watch, ahead. other than watch TV um, and cook, I like those things. I get, um, what happens is I get to the point where I just feel like I've got to go do something mm-hmm. and I have a fondness for like high intensity things. I like, I mean, I'm a sprinter and I'm not a runner. Um, I like lifting heavy stuff, but as a 60 year old guy with a back problem, I'm not allowed to do that so much anymore. Um, but I like things, I, I get bored easily. So it's gotta be something that's engaging. Yeah. Um, and it's gotta have a challenge component to it, either a literal competition or um, something that is self competing enough, self motivating enough and where I see progress so that I want to get to that next step. There's got to be some light at the end of the tunnel, some thing that I can actually accomplish that feels satisfying. So remember, I'm not a fitness professional. I'm an entertainment professional. I'm a director, okay. but I would say we're, we're, you could be my older brother in terms of our age. And I would say, if you didn't know much about fitness, I'd say, look, Steven, you're right. You're, you've got to be careful with your body. Everybody's backs break down as we get older. Number one, protect what you've got. And number two, you got to keep moving. So for instance, one of the things I'm picking up because I like to keep on changing it up is pickleball. Cause I like community. Cause I like movement. Cause Thank I like over 50. There's yeah. a little, hey, I'm over 50 and there's, and there's excitement and there's fun and again, mm. community and in getting out. So, so there's one I'm also doing, and I would recommend for you a little bit, not that this replaces everything. I think variety is really the spice of fitness. So I did some consulting for a VR company that was bought by Meta called Supernatural. And because of that, I researched VR and now I play table tennis with people around the world in virtual reality and it's mind blowing and I'm dripping in sweat often, you know, most of the time I'm having good conversations once in a while, there'll be, uh, you know, some jerk that's on there and you have to turn them off or deal with that. It's fun. And then last, and then, and and then my last uh, comment to you would be, if you wanted to get something, if you're in a, you're, I know you're in Colorado. So you have some times when you usually you've got beautiful weather, but sometimes if you're indoors, one of my favorite content is treadmill wise is I fit has a Nordic track. I did a bunch of work with them and they have done an extraordinary job of creating content that doesn't, that is not based on fitness. It's based on an experience. So one of the things I do, and I'm not a runner, 
but I wanted to do more, do more cardio, do more walking, do more running, learning how to do it is I climbed Mount Everest. It was a six week pro, I think it was six weeks, a six week program with three of the best climbers of Mount Everest in the world that told their stories, talked about the history of the mountain. It was, it was almost like watching a natural geographic movie while you are participating. And so that is something that stimulates the imagination as well as getting you in great shape and is different. So those are kind of like the three different things that are in my life and that I would recommend to you since we're in similar categories. I love it. And uh, um, the the VR table tennis, and I'm not a table tennis player, but I love that idea, uh, is uh, fascinating. Um, but I've got to tell you, wait, where are you living now? I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. If you were back in New York, I would point you to our friends over at Rome 149, mm. which is a sort of VR treadmill thing. Um, I, I can't even describe it. Um, let's just say Chris McDougall, who wrote Born to Run, we sent him over there and he said, this is the most fun I've ever had running. I don't mean running on a treadmill. I mean running ever. Nice. And so um, they're they're just getting started. They're hoping that they can franchise or build out over time. Um, but uh, for anyone who's in New York, go check out Rome 149 um, for something. I'll do it next time I'm there. That's cool. yeah, in that same vein, uh, they're over in, over in Hudson Yards, I think. And um, so, yeah, it's so funny. It's like I'm thinking about when the Nintendo Wii came out and a sort of, you know, virtual fitness, except that everyone quickly learned that you could just sit on a couch and flick your wrist. <laughs> yeah. Do the same thing uh-huh. as what they were, you know, doing. Um, the Xbox Connect never really took off in that same regard because it was a little ahead of its time in mm-hmm. terms of what it could do about being engaging. Um, but those are really interesting ideas. There's one that I was waiting to see if you said it when you said indoors. One thing that I actually do like, but I don't don't do it enough, I don't know what that means, um, is jumping rope. And Mm -hmm. I like it because there is that thing of developing a skill where you can very quickly see that you're demonstrably getting better um, yeah, yeah. and um, and finding ways of making it harder too. Um, there's, <laughs> I'm not allowed to mention this one explicitly the same way that I mentioned uh, people like Billy Blanks before, but there's a guy who owns a, or he's the CEO of a multi-billion dollar footwear brand. And he's a big jump roper. And he calls me every couple of months to say, you know, I only wear two shoes, the ones that we make in yours. And I wear yours when I'm jumping every day. And sometimes I just keep them on all day and I'm not, not allowed to say who it is, but, um, but, uh, but that's, that's another, again, for me, that was, a, in fact, I was uh, competing in jump rope for a while until I realized what happened? I don't know. There was something about it where I hit a point where I went, eh, I'm not going to be able to do the things that I really want to do. Like I'm too old to be able to do some of the stuff that would be super, super fun. So oh, I hit, yeah. yeah, I hit a limit in, or sort of like way back when I was doing circus arts, like Chinese pole and trapeze and things. And same thing. I'm not going to be in Cirque du Soleil. I'm not joining a circus and this is really hard. So um, yeah, that, that didn't do it. Um, sprinting is still for me, you know, a thing that I just enjoy if, and you know, I'm going to throw something else in the mix. I'm going to say that, and I'm going to see what you think about this one. Ideally, you also might want to find something that gives you some intermittent reinforcement where you can tell that it could have gone a little better if you had only done that. And I say that because intermittent reinforcement is the most addicting thing for human beings. Give us an example. Well, sprinting. So no one has ever finished a race thinking they did it perfectly. They always could have done better. When I finish a race and someone says, how'd you do? I said, do you just want a number for the time? Or can I tell you what I did wrong and give you the excuses? Because that's the way we normally talk about it. It's like, I did okay. You know, I stumbled out of the blocks, you know, I got, and even if your time is great, you always know you could do better. And that's very addictive. It's very much like any of the Japanese arts, like Zen archery or Ikebana, or, I mean, any of the Japanese arts where they set you up where you, you want to try and do it perfectly, but it's just not possible. Right. And oh, it's true of anything in life, really true, but they like really explicitly, you know, put you in that bind and you either just finally go, ah, screw it. I'm not going to do it. Or it just keeps you for life because you, you know, you can always do a little better. You can always pull that <laughs> slot machine and get, you know, all sevens instead of seven, seven and Bart Simpson. And, you know, and, and so whether I think that the social component is huge, uh, however you do that. And then that intermittent reinforced, look, playing table tennis, 
I have no doubt without asking you a question that there's times where you walk out, you had a great workout, but you're going, ah, God damn it. I could have, if I had just hit that one oh, shot. There's always somebody better. It's always in my head. Yeah. How do you get that guy's spin? There you go. Oh, it, oh, it's nonstop. That's what I like about it. I, I, I interviewed a guy uh, on the podcast interviewed, had a chat with a guy on this podcast who's a um, professional, well, world-class tennis, pl- uh, table tennis player. And he said something that I had never even heard of. He goes, oh, I'm a defensive player. It's like, mm. what he goes, my whole job is just to return the shot. I'm not trying yes. to crush it. I'm not trying to spike so it. I'm just going to wear them out. It was like, oh, that was so cool. I've played people who are much better than me. And I, and sometimes I'll pick up I'm like, oh, they're not killing the ball. They're just returning it. I'm the one who's trying to kill it. And eventually I make the mistake. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's brilliant. It, you know what? It's like this is going to sound crazy, um, but just for the fun of saying it. Um, so another conversation I recently had was with uh, someone that we support named Rafian Stotz. He's an MMA world champion. And in fact, we're about to start a contest. He's got a world championship fight coming up and we're giving away uh, um, uh, to one person tickets for two. Fly you there, put you up, the whole thing. And I said to Rafian, how do you. If for someone who's never watched an MMA fight or who thinks it's just horrible, brutal, whatever, but if you were going to sit them down and watch it and have them understand it at a different level, mm. what would you ask them to do? He said, um, you want to constantly look to see if you can figure out who's in control. And yeah. interestingly, the guy on the bottom, if they're on the ground, is often the one in control. And mm. same thing with table tennis. It's like everyone's looking for the smashes, but the guy in control is probably the one who just returns those. Often. Yeah, that's that's case. really cool. Yeah, <laughs> I, there's nothing I like more than um, discovering something about a sport or an activity that I would have never imagined in a million years. Um, which and th- that's a good one. So yeah, yeah huh. that's true. It's very true. So um, eGaz, um, you know, this is one of the podcasts. In fact, maybe the first where we haven't talked and don't necessarily even need to talk about feet and footwear, unless you find some urge to say something about that. But uh, but this has been more than enough fun for me without it. I have nothing to add probably that has never been said on your show about that. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. Um, but more importantly, um, you know, this, uh, I will, well, anyway. I will, I will add this about, actually, there is something. Okay. I, my, we adopted our children from Taiwan. This goes somewhere, believe me. And <laughs> we were visiting, we went back for a visit and they have, they're much more in tune with just general body wellness not fitness but body wellness yeah yeah yeah. so we went to their old neighborhood and there was a park that ran down the middle of a thoroughfare and there was like a gazebo that was a very long gazebo and it had all of these rocks that were embedded into this walkway and it was long i mean it was like it's like a hundred feet and we we realized what this is for this is for you to walk and to work on your your feet to yeah. to build up to work on your nervous system and it was none of us could really do it like i think i walked the whole length but it took forever and i'm taking my time <laughs> and i've now i've bought like a small pad and almost daily during tv time or something i'll take off my shoes and socks and i will need my feet on that and it's gotten better and better and i have very like soft feet because we i wear shoes all the time yeah musical theater and and, uh and it's it's great it it makes it makes a real difference in your body health i believe well um thank you for that pitch for a little product we sell on our website called a rocks rox rocks mat it's a little Uh, there you go version of that same thing inspired by that same idea i Um, I need to get one of yours uh i know a guy who can hook you up and uh, so there's that. We also have, there's a friend of ours, a doctor, a surgical podiatrist named Emily Splickle, and she's developed a, a product called, it's a technology called Naboso technology, which Naboso means barefoot in Czech. Um, and it's basically the right geometry for these little foot stimulating things. We have them as insoles and we made a sandal with the Naboso technology. That's all about foot stimulation. Um, we don't need to dive into this. We had you know, more than enough fun, but yeah, that, you know, starting by just getting your feet able to be, get the stimulation they need and then be able to function in something like, you know, a rocky surface um, is critically important for anything else you're going to do. My wife and I, we, we had a little anniversary vacation up in Grand Lake, Colorado, which is the headwaters of the Colorado River. And the trails around there 
Um, it's just all granite. And I mean, it's like lots and lots of rocks. They, they dug these trails out of a mountain and um, it's just so many rocks coming out of every place you could possibly walk. I joke that when they built the trails, it was like, yeah, this is good enough. And then they just walked away. <laughs> but it's incredible if you're in a shoe like ours, or you can hike these things barefoot, you have to actually work with the terrain and think wow. about it. I mean, you're working a problem. It's like rock climbing with your feet in a way. And it was so oh, much yeah. fun to do that. So yeah, that was another blast. Anyway, um, any any last, anything we want to think about in terms of the fun of fitness instead of the counting to 12 of fitness? Yeah, find what, back to like our personal conversation, Yeah, find what works and and don't measure yourself against anybody else. Just, oh, just see, I, see, I'm going to counter that with, pardon me. One of the reasons that I love sprinting, well, there's a caveat to it, is that you do measure yourself about against other people. Like at the starting line, someone will invariably turn to us, you know, and like very seriously, it's like, have a good race. And I go, hey, look, have fun. Don't get injured. And oh, yes, I really want to kick your ass. <laughs> and I think so, that's fine. It is it's two very different philosophies, though. Well, but it, so, but yeah. it's also it's the, but it's it's all of it encompassed. Like we all want to have fun, and we're all trying to win. Let's yeah. not yeah. be coy about it. We're yeah. all super competitive. We know that about ourselves. It, we know that it's stupid, and we're over trying to cr- change it. But I and get it. it for like yeah. I the, the table tennis. Usually, you know, I want to win. But when I'm playing somebody who's much better than me, I'm enjoying learning. Absolutely. But, but for the the reason why I said that is because. I know if I'm overly competitive on some things, I'm going to get hurt. I don't want to get hurt anymore. Because well, there is that. Is, well, it's counterproductive. No, no, you're, you're totally on people. There's a lot of people who will not do anything because they're not in shape. And right. so that's one of the things I'm just advocating is if you're not in shape or you don't feel like you fit in or whatever it is, is find something that feels good and just be consistent. Absolutely. At it. That's, that's the thing I'm pitching. <laughs> And, and, and I agree. And if you are in that situation, I mean, I'm putting in a, uh, uh, whatever I'm putting my hat in the ring for competition at the level that's appropriate. And this is the other thing there where in certain sports, for example, there, they really do break it down. So there are levels of the competition where you're working with the right people, or I have a good friend who's really into Brazilian jujitsu. And I said, you know, I would love to try that, but I know myself and, you know, I know I'd put myself in a dangerous situation. He goes, oh, then you work out with the best people in the gym. I went, but what? He goes, because they're the ones who know how to take care of you. Mm-hmm. They're the ones who know how to teach you what, you know, what you need to learn along the way, just like you said, rather than trying to beat you. Frankly, the kids that are going to start, kids, the people that are going to start in your basic class, they're the dangerous ones. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. But backing up to the competition, in a weird way for me as a sprinter, um, I have another layer of competition because one of the reasons that I enjoy the competition is that I'm good. I'm not the best in the world. I'm an all American and I'm, you know, I'm up there. If I was really bad, it wouldn't be as much fun, but the weird way that I'm competing against myself is that my goal is not to win a race necessarily. My goal is that I want to just keep hitting these all American times in my age group. And that's really, that's, a, that's certain. That's a, that's a great goal to reach. Well, because they get slower over time. <laughs> and, and so and my secondary goal is to live long enough that, you know, it's easy to hit those um, and that I can win the races because everyone else has died. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's a good one because it's, I mean, it's a fixed number. It's just on the edge of achievable. I mean, it, you know, it's not pushing me so hard. I'm going to do something stupid, but it's pushing me. And to your point, though, about, you know, uh, the, the problem with competition It took me, and I hope this is a lesson, it took me two years to learn that when I was training, if I had the thought, I'll just do one more, then that was the 20-year-old part of my brain talking, and I got to shut that guy up. And then it took me another two years to learn not to change my gait when I'm in a race and there's someone in the lane next to me either right in front of me or right behind me. Either one was making a difference for a while. I learned to literally and figuratively stay in my lane. Hmm. And, um, and those were, those were both hard won lessons. It took me years to learn how to do both of those. The one, the one you're talking about that I can relate to very much is um, I very much love snowboarding and skiing still. And the idea of you got to get in as many runs as possible, totally change that philosophy, get in as many great runs as possible lucky enough that i'm not like oh my god you got to get your money's worth like i'm like no my money's worth is great runs 
not yeah. how many runs. Yeah. So often you're like, oh, the snow's still great. The light's still good, but your body's just had enough and, you know, quit while you're ahead is the, is the, that's it. If, if, if I'm planning on doing, if I'm planning on doing, you know, four, 400 meter runs and the third one is really good, I'm done. That's it. Yeah. We got to come up with a good philosophy catchphrase for that. Besides quit while you're ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it. Uh, Somebody got it. Yeah. We'll think of, we'll think of something. Uh, It's uh, do three quarters of your best. It's uh, go, (laughs) Wait, hold on. It's just do it at 75%. That's it. Just do 75%. Or go. it's, uh, we'll, we'll think of something. Yeah, there we go. Uh, do P89X. Do, um, we'll, we'll, we'll find some. Anyway, Mason, this has been a total, total pleasure. And yeah, thank you. This um, was fun. Yeah. And so um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you for any reason whatsoever, is there a way any for them reason. to do that? Any Oil reason. change. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Babysit yeah. their kids, you know. Whatever. Love kids. Um, Mega Mace is my company, M-E-G-A-M-A-C-E.com. You can go there and reach out or I'm on LinkedIn under my name, Mason Benderwald. Awesome. So that'll all be in the show notes. And uh, for, well, I actually may as well say it. If you're listening and you're not going to look at the show notes, Mason, M-A-S-O-N, Bendewald, B-E-N-D-W-E-N-D-E-W-A-L-D. Yes, there sir. So, and for everyone else, uh, thank you. And again, just a reminder, go over to www.join the, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. Uh, there's no cost to join. It's just that was the domain that was available. And it's just the way you can find all the previous episodes, interact with us. Speaking of interacting, if you've got anything you want to reach out to me about, like a suggestion or a complaint, if you think I'm somehow suffering from cranial rectal disorientation <laughs> syndrome, I'm hip to that. If there's someone you think should be on the show, either because they're contributing to what this conversation can be, or they think that, again, I've got that cranial rectal problem. Uh, I'm open. I, there was a guy, a footwear designer from Europe, who thought I was a complete idiot, and I was begging him to come on the show with me, and uh, he just refused. And explain, it was hard for me. Explain well, why. Well, he didn't say why. I was tempted to re- send an email back that just said scared, but I chose not to. <laughs> so, But I'm, I'm open uh, is the bottom line, because I'm just all I care about here is having people – uh, well, is the truth about what it takes to have a happy, happy, healthy, strong body and have fun while you're doing that. And so in that vein and on that note, just go out, have fun and live life feet first.